Thank you, everyone. Um, so, I, I, yes, I am the Chief Data Officer for UBS Investment Bank. Sorry, I should have put that in there. Um, I used to be the Global Head of Innovation Labs, Graham, so sorry to disappoint you, um, but we actually closed the labs last year, uh, and I will come back to that later in my talk. Um, a couple of bits about me, um, just so you understand my point of view. Uh, first thing is, I think for the English-speaking people in the room, I'm currently what's referred to as neuroatypical, um, which means that I'm difficult, and I vacillate quite wildly between being chaotic and OCD, because I'm bipolar. So um, I, I think I'm one of those people who clearly fidgets, which is why I had the guys wire me up with a lapel mic so I can pace, because it helps disperse the energy. I also go off on tangents, so I've made myself some notes. What you will not find is a set of slides. I hate slides. PowerPoint is the work of Satan, to quote my mother. Um, it, it forces us all to try to categorize our brain and put it into a series of bullet points taken totally out of context. Um, that and plus, to be honest, if I put up slides, then I have to have my internal marketing and comms people approve them, and that's always a pain in the backside. So I'm going to talk to you from my personal point of view. Um, for those of you closer up, you can see the gray hair and the receding hairline. I have been working in data for over three decades. Um, so it was back before it was a discipline, back before it was sexy, back when I used to have to root around in filing cabinets and Iron Mountain storage lockers, all the way through data processing departments, and more recently working with graph databases, visualizing data. So it's an interesting one for me because I've kind of always done this. But for some reason now, it's cool. <laughs> Go figure. Um, Di, are you here? No, she's not. A colleague of mine from WPP, Di Mays, was here yesterday. I was hoping she would be here today so I could foist you onto her because she's better socially than I am. Um, the two of us also sit on the uh, advisory board for Gartner, for the chief data officer community. And we both made the data IQ 100 list last Thursday, so that was fun. Um, the reason I share those two sound bites with you is because clearly I'm up here because I actually do have a clue. However, going with the lack of slides again, the fact something has worked for me does not mean it's going to work for you, right? It really is that basic. I, I when I was younger, like you, <laughs> I would show up at these things and hope to take a picture of the last slide thinking I had the answer to bring back to the office, not saying you're that naive, I was, um, and, and, and it never worked. Right, Because again, the solution is always out of context. So that's, that's me in the intro. The other thing I need to do is just the disclaimer, all my personal opinions. Right, I'm not going to talk about UBS as a company, because you either know who we are, and you have your own bias and opinion on that, or you don't, which means you don't care. And equally, I'm not going to talk about our projects, because I'm sure I could go around this room and every one of you has a fabulous data project that you could talk about. So I'm going to talk more about people, experience, and the interaction side. So I'm going to start with definitions, right? Hopefully you're all data nerds in the room, so this shouldn't be a shocker to you. But this series, or the sorry, presentation title about human insight and augmented analytics, I think it's important to set a baseline for what that means. So for the avoidance of doubt, because humans should be a given, but it's used in so many ways these days, I mean homo sapiens. So all of you in this room, right? Some of you may think you're better than other people in the room. You're not, sorry. Um, I'm not better than any of you either. I could learn something from everyone here, I have no doubt. Might be how to make an omelet. Don't care, but I guarantee you there's something I can learn from everybody here. So the collective group of the seven billion of us on the planet is what I'm talking about. And insight, I do have my phone with me. Sorry, AV guys, I did put it in my pocket, not in my breast pocket. I wanna read to you Oxford English Dictionary definitions, right? So what better place to start? So if we actually take a look at what the academics at Oxford mean when they say insight, they talk about the capacity to gain an accurate and deep understanding of something or someone. Sounds plausible, right? So human insight is all about taking our collective lived experience and applying that to the millions of data points that your brain is processing every day, right? How many people here in the room, when you were a kid, stuck your hand on the stove or in a fireplace and burned it? Come on, be honest. <laughs> Those of you who didn't raise your hand are not being honest. Um, so again, everybody does it. When you're two or three, you don't have a clue. The flames look pretty. You stick your hand in, you're the first child. Your parents were too stupid to buy a fire guard, right? You burn your hand, you go to the doctors, you get it plastered, they buy a fire guard. Fabulous, right? The next time, you don't stick your hand in. 
It's not rocket science, right? Your parents feed you little biscuits when you're out doing shopping to keep you quiet in the pram. You love it. They take you home, they feed you broccoli, you spit it out. That tastes like dirt. I had dirt in the playground yesterday. I didn't like it. I don't like this. So we immediately constantly assimilate data, create bias on that data, and infer what we're going to do with that data. So that takes us to the second part of the definition, augmented analytics. If we actually look at the definition of augmented, I actually don't agree with this one, but it's a good starting point. Having been made greater in size or value, right? So again, for the purposes of analytics, we can assume that what we're gonna talk about is how we can improve on something. Now, analytics is not a word. Look it up, <laughs> I did, I was surprised. Analytic is, but that's an adjective, so you can't make it plural. So as I started to talk to some of my colleagues, I kind of came to this conclusion that we created the word analytics as a computer engineering term to talk about applying technology to the human process of analysis. So that's kind of interesting, because if you think about that, what the technology allows us to do is operate at scale, right? We can process more data faster than we can as humans. Not that our brains can, let's be clear, right? But just using our optical input or our auditory input much, much faster. So if you combine the two things, if you use the technology in a way to rapidly sift through all the dross that we all have, right? Try to find the things that could be interesting or the patterns that could be interesting and then apply the human insight to that. You get much better value than if you just try to use a Tableau dashboard, right? So I'll take Netflix as an example. So everybody here has probably read an article about how cool Netflix is, right? Their algorithm, Amazon's the same thing. I bought books X, it recommends book Y. That's not artificial intelligence, just to be clear, right? Artificial intelligence, when you talk to people who know what it is, will tell you we are still decades away from recreating what a three-year-old can do. Think about that for a second, right? What we talk about when we talk about artificial intelligence is actually programmatic machine learning. It's somebody writing a process that takes data inputs and produces an outcome. Now the outcome could be variable, but it still is following a process. Algorithms do not learn. You cannot teach an algorithm to learn. What you can do is adapt the data set so that the algorithm works differently, and you can also tweak the algorithm. But they don't teach themselves, regardless of what the vendors out there might tell you, right? <laughs> so again, those algorithms allow us and allow me to assimilate much more data than I ever could before. But then I have a different challenge to you. How much of that data is useful? I mean, again, like, go back to the 80s when I used to troll around warehouses full of filing cabinets, right? It was a pain in the ass trying to find the right data. But the reality is, is when I finally found it, it was useful. But most of what I found wasn't. And I think it's the same way today. But because technology has evolved, and it's cheaper now to store things, we keep everything, whether it's valuable or not, right? Part of my bipolarness, I also am a hoarder. I like have everything. <laughs> Drives my wife nuts. The boxes in the loft, the storage locker, everywhere you look in, their, in our house, there's something. I've got like computer equipment from the 80s, science fiction books that were shit when I read them as a teenager, but I've still kept them because hey, I bought it, right? Um, and we do the same thing. As humans, we're hoarders. Now, not everybody's Marie Kondo, but I guarantee you Marie Kondo has a closet somewhere that we don't ever see that's full of all the crap she wants to keep. But it's hidden, right? So again, we feel a natural connection to data, and we feel a natural connection to things. So we therefore try to hoard and keep everything we can because we don't know if it's ever going to be useful sometimes. And for any of you who have a compliance team, which I do because I work in a bank, <laughs> they always want you to keep everything because you never know whether a client's gonna complain, whether there's gonna be some sort of regulation review or a lawsuit or something. So you keep it because you might need it. But that makes it actually harder because how do you actually then sift through to find the meaningful thing, right? So one of the bullet points I'm gonna put into the agenda was this idea of you know how do we leverage data science and AI to derive business insight. So I kind of debunked the AI bit for a bit, but it's not business insight that we should care about. It's new business insight, right? Literally for decades, people have been using technology to process business information. Your accountant 
does that, always has, right? Is using software to look at your cash flow, your revenue, your income statements, decide whether or not you decide, need that extra 3% pay rise this year, sir. <laughs> so again, that sort of business insight has always been there. What we collectively, as a set of data specialists, data nerds, data geeks, whatever we want to call ourselves, want to do is derive new business insight. Right? So I will give you an example from a previous employer who shall remain nameless. So I was hired to run funding for a part of the business. So I'd never done this before, so I kind of thought it was interesting. They hired me into the technology area because they had systems that managed the funding. And they were expensive and they were cumbersome and they thought that I would be able to transform it and make it simpler because that's kind of what I do, I transform things. So I went in, I took a look at the systems, and what I didn't realize when I took the job was there was about 100 people who were sitting trying to use all these different systems to predict how much money they needed to run different parts of the business. Not to actually determine, to predict. Anybody here remember Mystic Meg? <laughs> it's the same thing, right? 100 people with crystal balls gazing into it every day, trying to figure out how much does this part of the business need? How much money do I put in the account? And they always got it wrong, always, right? And again, it was because they couldn't access easily the data they needed. So the very first thing I did was say, right, I let the tech guys keep doing what they're doing because they're doing all sorts of patches and cyber updates and reg fixes. And I built a business analysis team and we went and took a look at where's all the data? Where's the meaningful data? Where's the things people are using? We cataloged it. And then we did a cleanliness exercise on it, which was not sexy, right? But actually, what we did with that exercise, which took us about three months, was improve the accuracy of the predictions. But again, neuroatypical. Predictions still didn't work right for me. I kept thinking, I can balance my checkbook. Why the hell can't I balance the checkbook for the firm, right? So I then started to think, okay, where's the problem? I tried to work with these people in operations, tried to understand how they work. And what I realized, because this isn't me, actually, I'm very not change resistant. I also have no sense of career self-preservation, which is a different problem. Um, all of these people had been doing their job for at least 10 years, some of them for 20 or 30. So they built up a pattern of behavior of how they did their job. And it didn't matter that over that time, new data had come along, or new systems had come along, or new businesses had opened up they needed to support. They still kept doing it the same way. And so actually I decided, and this, this is where the career self-preservation thing could have gone very badly for me, um, was I went to the corporate treasurer. And I said, I really don't think we need any of those people. We just don't. There's got to be a better way to do it, right? And she set me a challenge. It was a she. <laughs> Women are much more cynical than men. Um, and she said, prove it. I give you six months. What do you need? I said, I have no idea. She said, well, take it out of your own budget. Do whatever you want. You have six months to prove it to me. If you can't, go back to doing what you were doing, right? So I, I spent the six months, um, and I decided to take a look at all the data. And I decided to take a look at how to conjoin all the data and how to make it accessible in real time. I didn't copy it, right? This was 10 years ago when everybody was talking about big data, another bingo buzzword. And instead what I did was I just made it available. Didn't remove it from its systems. I just put it into a dashboard. And then actually working with my tech team, we built algorithms that just did all the computations very, very fast. We actually had the first prototype working in one country handling all of the cash flow within three months. And they said, okay, let's try it out. We'll run it in parallel alongside the Mystic Megs. We got the number right every single day for the first month, which the accountant then came back and said, in real terms, you've saved us 10 million. And I said, like, how? Right? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. We didn't fire 10 million worth of resources already. And he said, because every time we get the funding wrong, we have to borrow money. There's a cost to borrowing the money, right? If you don't get your balances right at some banks, they penalize you. So all of us, right, we're used to the fact that if you go below zero on your current account or your checking account, your bank fines you. Well, it turns out if you're a company, if you go above a certain balance in certain accounts, they fine you as well. I had no clue, right, because I had no experience funding before I started the job. The reason I share the anecdote with you is because the number one thing that you can do to develop insights from your data is get different people to look at the data, right? I started my career studying nuclear engineering. I think you were in the panel yesterday, weren't you? So, no? 
No, you were, sorry. <laughs> <Which> we, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> and we were talking about this yesterday, right? I've worked in defense, I've worked in academia, I've worked in media. I wound up in banking 20 years ago, kind of by accident, because I was busy building channels for media companies, right? And the, some consultancy came to me and said, all the banks want to get into the internet, so you know, could you come help? Um, but I was never a technologist in the traditional sense. I was what I call a business technologist. I looked at ways to apply the technology to a business problem. I don't care about blockchain. Actually, quick question. Anybody in the audience, just raise your hand and shout. Don't move, Emma, it's fine. Um, who here knows how long blockchain's been around? Come on, somebody, be brave. You can be wrong. It's okay to be wrong in academia. Nobody want to hazard a guess? 20 years. Ooh, smart. Whoever said that, raise your hand. So I don't quite have, my, I'm losing my distance vision as well and I'm too proud to get bifocals. <laughs> so the, the young lady is right. Sorry, I'm assuming you're young, can't see Claire at the light. It's a compliment either way, right? <laughs> so Bitcoin was launched onto the internet in 1999, 23 years ago. That's when the first practical application of blockchain as a technology was released onto the world. In the intervening 23 years, Anybody want to tell me what it's actually changed? Other than the fact we are, you know, finding it very hard to buy graphics cards for our kids for their gaming computers, hasn't bloody moved the world forward at all, right? Hasn't unseated the world of finance. There's lots of really interesting use cases that people have built. Maersk has got one shipping, uh, tracking shipping containers around the world. It's actually a fabulous use case, but I could have done it with any of a dozen other technologies. So it's like literally they just wanted to show off blockchain so they could look to be cool and funky. So I think that the, the fundamental thing, and this comes back to my point at the beginning about the innovation labs, is that if you ever start from the point of view that you have a technology you want to apply to your data, you're gonna fail. You just are. You'll drop 10 bucks, sorry, 10 million for the non-bankers in the room. <laughs> we talk in shorthand because the numbers are so ridiculous. Um, and you won't release any more business value by doing so. So again, anybody with gray hair and a receding hairline in the room will remember 30 years ago, there was a big push for data warehouses, right? We all spent tens of millions on data warehouses. None of them worked, so then we built data marts, which were collections of data warehouses. Then there was the big data craze, then there was the data lake craze, which I started calling data swamps because I thought it was stupid. Now we've got data lake houses? I mean, for Christ's sakes, right? And now everybody wants to talk to you about mesh. What is Mesh? Mesh is basically saying, you know 30 years ago when the data was all in the individual applications, we should have just left it there and saved ourselves a couple of trillion dollars because we're gonna put it all back. I mean, literally, consultant, buzzword, bingo. That's what I like to call it. Any consultants in the audience, please don't make yourself known because I'll kneecap you as we leave. <laughs> so, look. <laughs> Let's take a look at it totally differently, right? If we assume we set up an innovation lab, right? Most people assume it was a technology one. It was not. So I used to be the CIO for the investment bank when the president of the bank asked me to become the head of innovation. And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, why? And I said, because what does that even mean? Um, and by the way, he had an idea of what it meant, but none of his board agreed with it. Like there were 13 different definitions around the board and the head of research actually said, sorry, I'm the most innovative person in this room, I should run the innovation lab. To which you know, the president said, well, tell you what, if you can clone yourself, go for it, but you have a day job, right? Which did not make me feel warm and fuzzy since I was not on the board and I was gonna be the face of innovation. So when I set up the team, I said, look, I don't wanna talk about tech. I accept we live in a world where tech permeates everything we do. But actually, we are not a tech company. And the number one mistake that so many of us make is trying to compete with the tech companies, right? So I said, I'm gonna focus on business innovation. I'm gonna figure out new markets, new products, new segments, new ways of working with our customers instead of how do I do pricing strategies faster? How do I leverage quantum for Monte Carlo simulations, which if any of you are bankers in the room, you'll know how stupid that was. Um, and so again, we ran it very much as a, you give us ideas. 
that you think would transform your business, that you don't have the resources or are not willing to place the bet on, right? Because anybody who's ever run a business before, you have an operating plan, right? You have resources, you have tech costs, you have office costs, you have targets, whether they're revenue targets, efficiency targets, throughput targets, doesn't matter. So everybody always has ideas how they can drive their business better, but they don't always have the resources to do it. So that was how we portrayed ourselves. And our goal was to try to challenge people to think different. So he offered me 20 headcount for the first lab, and I took four, which everybody thought was insane. And I said, but what I want to do is every time we run a project, let's bring somebody to work on the project with us. We time box everything for three months. Pull someone out of operations, pull someone out of finance, pull a trader off a trading desk. I did that once. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe the hell I caught for that one. Um, but the, the, rea the reality is, is we got the people together who understood the business. We worked together disruptively, literally in a little hothouse, and then they all went back to their day jobs. So what happens when people experience that and go back to their day jobs, right? They actually realize they can be disruptive in their day jobs in a way that doesn't put the business at risk. So we set up another lab in Singapore, we set up another one in New York, and we were doing dozens of projects like this, and we had great success. And then last year, talking with some of the board, I realized there were innovation teams all over the investment bank. The COOs had their own little innovation team going. The operations team had their own little innovation team going. And actually, as we looked further outside of the investment bank, it'd been like a plague. <laughs> We'd actually spread the whole idea that you could be disruptive in innovation in your job across the firm. And there are literally thousands of people doing it now, right? So again, let's come back to human insight and people. People are scared, right? AI scares people. Why? Consultants and media. Right? Everybody's been saying for the last several years that 80% of all of our jobs are going to be gone. Right? They'll be done by computers and robotics. It's just not true. It's not true any more than Bitcoin was going to disrupt the banks and make them all go under 20 years ago than it is today. And it was no different, by the way, with our agrarian society going to industrial farming, where everybody thought they were going to be out of a job. No, the jobs changed. Right? You didn't necessarily work your own small holding anymore. You worked on someone else's small holding, or you worked in a co-op, collecting things to distribute, or a processing facility. It's the same thing with the Industrial Revolution. As we moved from lots of people building lots of things in small ways right, to scale, the jobs changed. By the way, the interesting thing is with 3D printing and the current global crisis is that everybody wants to go back to doing things at smaller scale in their own countries, right? So it's funny how history always kind of circles back on itself. Machine learning and data is the same thing, right? What you have to do is work out how you can disrupt your people's thinking. So I have a data management office. I do not have, sorry, I gotta keep an eye on the time because I'm sure Emma's gonna wave at me somewhere. Yeah, there she is, five minutes, okay. Um, <laughs> I have a data management office. The people are brilliant, right? They can look at data, they can understand it, they can see where things are incomplete or not being delivered on time, quality could be suspect. But trying to get those same people to look at the same data and think, is there something we could do different with it? Could we commercialize it? Could we actually look at a way to manage the business differently? They struggle, and it's not because they're stupid. It's just because they've been doing the same thing for years in the exact same way. So what I did was I went and hired a woman from an AI startup, and I brought her in to set up a center of excellence. And what we're trying to work on at the moment is how do we go from, say, 300 data scientists in UBS to 100,000 citizen data scientists across the firm? So last year, when our new CEO came in, Ralph, he set up a bunch of strategy working groups, and one was on data. And I got volunteered by my COO to join the group. And, and the first thing the strategy guys wanted to do was, let's do an inventory of all our data science platforms. Let's do an inventory of all of our people. The alarm bells immediately went off in my head, because, you know, gray hair, receding hairline. I've seen this rodeo before. I thought, they're going to centralize everything. And sure enough, within about a month, that was what they were already talking about. We don't have enough money to hire data scientists for everywhere. So let's just bring everybody together into one big group hug, and they can deliver for the firm. It just doesn't work. Because when you do that, the people who have the business context in marketing, in finance, in risk, leave. right? Because they're not doing what they're passionate about anymore. They become part of data science pod 237, 
right? And they work on whatever random shite somebody throws them at a given point in time. My opinion, my opinion, just to reinforce that bit. Um, <laughs> so what I did was I changed the narrative, right? I got together with some of my business colleagues, and I made the proposition that if what we could do was instead of plow money into centralizing and making those people 10% more efficient, which, by the way, there were only about three or 400 people in the bank, right? Not even 1%. If we could instead focus outwards with the same amount of money and make the 99,700 people <laughs> more effective in what they did, that the efficacy uplift would be phenomenal. It would be exponentially better, right? We could service more clients. We could service clients faster, sorry. We could hit our target balances quicker, right? Or more accurately. And we launched ADA officially this year, right? Which stands for AI Data and Analytics, but also I came up with the acronym because of Ada Lovelace, because I'm a nerd, right? But again, that is what we're trying to do now as a firm, is figure out how we can actually empower 100,000 people to get access to and manipulate the data. And this was something we talked about in the panel yesterday, right? The cataloging. Do not underestimate the power of cataloging important data, not all data, important data, right? You can start that easily enough just by having a look around to your business colleagues and saying, what data matters to you? Let me work with you to catalog it. Let me help you. Because I got people who don't work in your business who might find patterns in that data that you wouldn't see because you're so used to looking at it with a singular focus, right? And that transformation for us is what's actually powering our business. It's just about how we can say to people, look, don't be afraid. The robots aren't going to take your job. Your job is going to change. And if you're change resistant, that's a challenge. But we'll still need those roles. We just might need fewer of them, right? So there is still space for everybody. But you have to help people along the way. Because if you don't, best case scenario, they leave, right? Which might be good for some of them. OK, Emma. <laughs> but worst case scenario, you get poison pills. You get people who are disenfranchised and so change resistant they become negative, and it actually causes problems. So you cannot underestimate, no matter how much tech you throw at the problem, right, the people equation. And, and by the way, you don't want to hire people like me necessarily because I'm really hard to manage, as my boss tells me all the time. But do hire people from other industries and other backgrounds. I, I am widely acknowledged in the bank as having the most diverse team in the bank. But it took me a hell of a lot of work to do that. I have 50% men and women in my team. I have 20% Caucasian, 70% BAME, right? Now, that doesn't mean that I have all black people in my team or all Asian people in my team. It means that I have a mix of people, genders and backgrounds. Because that cognitive difference is what makes my team hyper-efficient and very, very good at what they do. It also is a pain in the backside to manage, just to be clear, right? If you get that level of diversity in your team or your management team, it's like herding pigeons. I know the phrase is herding cats, but the difference is if you get the cats in a corner, they can't go anywhere. You get the pigeons in a corner, somebody flies over your head and poops on you. So it's actually a lot of work. Do not underestimate it. But the benefits can be huge. Right, Emma, where are you? Sorry, time. Am I allowed to open the floor for a question since we started late? <laughs> OK. Right. Um, I will stick around for a little bit if anybody wants to ask me questions. Please do not try to sell me something, because that's not where my head is at today. Um, but I am happy to answer questions based on my personal experience. And I hope, if nothing else, I entertained you. 